matter. I want to wish you a welcome to this uh, session on transboundary e-commerce and online platforms and the legal challenges that are numerous as you know them and therefore it's a privilege for me to be bit amongst you to moderate this session with eminent experts that I will introduce to you in an instant on issues that are dear to us whether we are consumers and we are all consumers or decision makers or even companies and we are going to talk about legal implications and technological developments that defy our faculty for adaptation for us all developed countries as well as developing countries and we are going to concentrate on companies and particularly on the commitment of African uh, um, consumers in uh, e-commerce. When you look globally, the different notions of confidentiality and the diversity of interests of stakeholders, uh, all these crude tensions, we have different interests therefore. The persons that we are are preoccupied by our right to confidentiality and may be able to use uh, uh, online services in all con uh, trust uh, and the governments on their hand have the issues of security and national national security and, sh and safety and companies are also preoccupied with issues of conformity and uh, regulation regulations that may hinder innovation and commerce i want to give you some figures uh, uh, from the cyber law tracker of the ANCTAD where we try to update uh, the progress on legislation uh, with regard to electronic transactions and the cyber crime and the right to for consumption for uh, online consumers and also for data protection if we look at the case of Africa only 56 percent of African countries have uh, legislation on electronic transactions and cyber crime and only 43% have a legislation on data protection and 37% have a legislation that pre protects online consumers. Therefore, the figures are very low, as you may see. A recent study that was uh, undertaken in 2018 with Ipsos in particular and the Center for International Governance and Innovation in partnership with the Internet Society this study revealed uh, growing concerns concerning confidentiality and online security, data security. More than half of the people surveyed in the 25 economies uh, uh, were concerned with their online uh, private lives online with regard to a year um, ago. This growing concerns is normal and because we all hear a lot about the millions of data that has been hacked and this morning the Minister of Trade of Senegal uh, was said in said another session that uh, his uh, bank card had been, been uh, hacked there is technological innovation but also threats and therefore we are all concerned and we do not what to do we have new regulations as we're going to see in the session that's coming, especially with the uh, r regulation from the European Union on data protection. And what we see uh, with ACTAD, with the studies that we have undertaken, is that we have, we have an enormous need to strengthen capacity. The technology advances so fast that sometimes we are not able to catch up and even developing countries are concerned with this to be able to update themselves so that they can have uh, legislation that is always updated and that is supplied. I hope therefore that in this session we will concentrate not only on legal issues uh, or legal problems but that panelists will also be able to give a number of pathways to solutions to be able to advance in this area and to have uh, a clean ecosystem for the development of uh, e-trade and uh, uh, digital economy. Without more introduction, let me move to the first uh, uh, intervener. Receive all in English, so I give some work to the uh, English and French interpreters. So we have first Mr. Bruno Gencarelli. Uh, he heads, uh, is heading the International Data Flow and Protection Unit at the European Commission in the DG Justice. He led the Commission's work in the area of data protection 
in the phase of the negotiations on the General Data Protection Regulation, not known as GDPR, and the EU-US Data Transfers Arrangement. He was also one of the lead negotiators of the EU-US Privacy Shield and Umbrella Agreement, and recently negotiated the mutual adequacy arrangements with Japan. Mr. Giancarelli, the objective of the GDPR was to give citizens control and consent over the use of their personal data and to simplify the regulatory environment for business. The data protection reform was key and, and a key member of the digital single market in Europe. So I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one will relate to the GDPR. What does that mean for uh, African firms making business in the EU? So if you can elaborate on the constraints or adaptation required and priority that they need to target. And the second one is more at the policy level. Uh, and to see, because the process of adopting, again, this regulation was quite long. So if you could share with us uh, the negotiation process and how uh, the African partners could uh, get inspiration from this, uh, this process and this uh, regulation. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, bonjour à tous. I will speak in uh, happy then to answer uh, questions in French. Uh, very pleased and honored to be here. Uh, very happy also that the European Commission is one of the uh, 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 core uh, partner in the organization of uh, this week together with uh, UNCTAD and uh, uh, the African Union uh, uh, partners. I think that uh, Vice President Ansip, the Vice President of the European Commission uh, earlier this week, has stressed in his, in his remarks how important this event uh, and this week uh, is for us and how important uh, the partnership and the, the strengthening of the partnership uh, with Africa in the, in, 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 in the digital area is important. Um, thanks for those questions. Let me maybe start by uh, stressing. I will, of course, uh, it's impossible today uh, not to uh, pronounce uh, the uh, acronym of GDPR. But uh, behind this acronym, what is, uh, uh, we, we find the uh, issues of, 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 of privacy, of data security, which are not European issues, as they are not African issues. They are truly global issues. And I guess that's why uh, also they are uh, uh, on the agenda uh, of this uh, of this, uh, uh, of, of this, of, on the program of this event, um, let me give you a couple of examples to understand immediately uh, how global these issues are. Uh, recent incidents, such as uh, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, have certainly uh, reminded us how much privacy is crucial, and it's first an issue of uh, human dignity, and that's exactly what. Supreme Court of India said last year in a landmark, uh, 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 landmark uh, judgment uh, which recognized uh, the uh, constitutional uh, nature, or the nature as a fundamental right of a human right as of privacy by stressing that this is an essential facet of the dignity of the human being. Those, those scandals, those revelations also have uh, stressed that um, have made us realize how much there is at stake, not only from an individual point of view, but also from a collective point of view, for the society as a whole, including for the, functioning, for the very functioning of democracy and the integrity of, of, of electoral process. These developments have also reminded us of why it is important, and therefore they have, sorry, they have reminded us of why it is important to protect data as a central individual right, as a democratic imperative, and also as an uh, economic uh, necessity. Uh, without consumer trust uh, in the way that data is handled, uh, there can be no sustainable growth of our increasingly uh, data-driven economy. And that, again, that's true for Europe, that's true for Africa, that's true for uh, many other parts in the world. So the, the GDPR is indeed the EU answers uh, to these challenges and to these opportunities. Um, whether, this is, whether this is the perfect uh, receipt, well, it's not for me to say. Um, uh, but maybe I can stress two or three elements that I think are interesting uh, uh, to keep in mind while we are seeing uh, an increasing number of countries around the world and in Africa uh, uh, developing or modernizing their, their privacy uh, uh, legislation. First, I think three key elements of the GDPR. First, the GDPR is about uh, harmonization. 
the need to have uh, uh, common rules of the game, the need to ensure that data can flow freely between industry, between sectors, between the private and the, private, uh, and the public sector. We had in Europe 28, because we have 28 member states of the European Union, we had 28 uh, data protection legislation. That didn't make sense uh, in an area such as data processing, which is borderless almost uh, by nature. So this, this issue that we found in data protection, but on, on, in uh, uh, many, other, many other fields we, we are going to discuss of, 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 of regulatory uh, uh, fragmentation and of legislative fragmentation, was at the core of uh, and at the source and the origin of this process. That's why also it has been a very long process, four years of negotiation in the EU, because, you know, uh, uh, harmonization is uh, something which is seen uh, as a, a complex, sensitive, and uh, 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 it's about uh, uh, deciding to have uh, common rules and then which common rules, whether they should apply uh, also to the public sector, for instance. And uh, 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 we were very happy with the result of this negotiation uh, in terms of having a, a real uh, overarching legislation. Uh, that uh, covers uh, all sectors, all industry, the private and the public sector, because again, uh, in the digital year, you need uh, those, those, those uh, uh, regulatory silos uh, uh, don't make uh, any, uh, any sense. Uh, second, uh, uh, second aspect of, 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 of the GDPR, which I guess is important uh, to stress, uh, is uh, empowering individuals, and in that way, creating or strengthening trust. The idea here was to create a, a virtuous circle between uh, 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 better uh, protecting, uh, protecting better privacy as a fundamental right, in that way enhancing uh, consumer confidence uh, in how the privacy and the security of the data is guaranteed, and uh, 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 through that uh, contributing to the uh, further development of, of, of the digital economy. And um, the third aspect is, um, and that was of course also very, because you, you've asked me about our negotiation, was very central uh, in our negotiation, how uh, and one of the key aspects of these negotiations was how to establish a, a balance, an equilibrium between uh, the protection and the use of data, between protection and innovation, and so on. Um, there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, misgivings about uh, data protection legislation. So I would say, in certain cases, even fake news, data protection legislation are not about prohibiting the use of data, but ensuring that uh, data can be processed in a way which is respect respectful for, for human rights and in a way which can uh, uh, contribute to that uh, consumer trust uh, I was mentioning. And um, we have, uh, while reforming our rules, because that's another uh, uh, often a, 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 something uh, which I often hear, uh, which is uh, not accurate. I mean, data protection rules didn't appear in, in Europe uh, last May. They have been in place for, for decades, but we have decided through the GDPR to, to modernize and uh, to modernize them. And in, in looking for that, for, for, for that balance, um, we moved away from, I would say, a old-fashioned uh, 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 approach, which was uh, basically a, uh, an approach of uh, one-size-fits-it-all uh, uh, solution, in which all, all obligations apply to any type of processing of data, to an approach which, uh, for instance, um, is uh, uh, looks more at uh, uh, what risks, uh, which risks and the level of risks, uh, uh, risk for privacy, which is involved in, 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 in data uh, processing. That's the so-called risk-based approach. Why it is important? Because first, it, reduce, it reduces the regulatory burden, uh, burden for companies that carry out, I would say, basic monda mundane processing operations. Well, the, uh, uh, and that's very important when you are dealing, like in most economies of the world, with a lot of small and, 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 uh, and medium-sized uh, companies. And many of them uh, uh, process that, as I said, in a very basic, uh, mundane way, uh, sending an email uh, to the customers every uh, six months uh, uh, to uh, uh, share news about new products or, or offers, etc. 
all this doesn't need to be subject uh, to the same uh, level of uh, obligations than uh, processing of data that are very intrusive uh, for, for privacy. For instance, uh, uh, processing of uh, 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 sensitive data, of health data, uh, 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 and, and, and so on. So this idea of the scalability of legislation, uh, uh, that you can adapt uh, uh, the obligations to the uh, level of risk which is uh, involved uh, in, 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 a, in a given processing, is, I think, uh, it's certainly uh, something, something new in the GDPR and something which is worth, worth thinking about when, when developing a new, a new privacy framework. The second advantage of, of this approach is that it creates incentives to develop innovative uh, privacy, privacy friendly solution uh, from the earliest stage of development of a service of a product. Because in a certain sense, you're rewarded if you're innovative in privacy, you're rewarded because you reduced the risk on privacy and therefore you're subject to a reduced uh, uh, regulatory uh, burden. So this idea that uh, privacy uh, pays off also from, from, uh, from that point of view and also from, from a competitive uh, point of view. Um, and uh, maybe my last point is, and that brings me to uh, where I started, it, what is important to, to stress is that these developments that took place in Europe through the adoption of the GDPR are not limited to Europe, but as I said, are part of a more global trend. Today, there are more than 100 countries uh, in the, around the world that have uh, data privacy laws in place. Many of these uh, new and, uh, or modernized laws uh, tend to be based on common elements. A comprehensive legislation, rather than sectoral rules, for the reasons I've indicated. They need to, to have common rules of the game uh, in place, and they need to, to ensure that data can, can move across industries, uh, sectors, business models. A set of enforceable rights, again, to, to, to empower individuals, and the setting up of an independent uh, supervisory authority. This convergence is, is also taking place uh, on this continent, we are seeing many, many African countries uh, which are again either adopting new privacy laws or modernizing their privacy laws. We are speaking here in Kenya, a country which is currently, uh, 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 um, uh, which has currently a, 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 a looking at a bill, uh, a, a new privacy, uh, a new, a new privacy uh, legislation. This is happening in this continent also at regional level. We are seeing uh, interesting developments. For instance, uh, the creation of, n of a network uh, between uh, African data protection authorities. That's very important because when we're talking about privacy, but this can be applied probably in many other fields, it shouldn't be only be about a, a legislation on a piece of paper. It's about enforcement, and those incidents I was referring to uh, uh, have, uh, have indicated uh, how I mean, we, need to be, we need to get serious about, about uh, enforcing those, those rules uh, for the impact on individuals, for the impact on, on, on even on, on the democratic life uh, of, of our countries. So the fact that uh, enforcers are coming together uh, in Africa and exchanging best practice and trying to develop common interpretation is, is uh, uh, certainly a, a, a very interesting, an interesting development. Um, and again, this is a, a, a global trend. We are seeing it from, from, from Chile uh, to, to, to South Korea, uh, from, from California uh, uh, to Japan. In a world that is often characterized by uncertainty and unpredictability, this developing conver convergence in privacy standards is, is certainly a very uh, positive, positive development uh, for, for, for many reasons. First, this trend offers uh, new opportunities to facilitate data flows and therefore trade at both uh, regional and global levels. In fact, having uh, convergent data protection regulations uh, helps data to be uh, transferred uh, and shared more freely and, and, and safely uh, within a region, within a continent, and for instance, between the EU uh, and, uh, and, its, and its partners. Um, contributing in, the, in this way to a more integrated business environment uh, that can boost uh, trade and investment. Convergence is also good, and, and being part of that uh, convergent trend is, 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 is good, uh, given that companies increasingly operate across borders and prefer to apply a similar set of rules in all their business operations worldwide. 
being part of this uh, uh, global trend can, can help economies uh, contribute to uh, an environment conducive to direct investment and improve trust between uh, commercial partners. Third, having uh, common data, or convergent data protection rules in place great, greatly facilitate exchange of data between public authorities. Because trust is not about only trust of individuals vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, 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 commercial uh, operators, but it's also trust of individuals vis-à-vis -vis their public authorities in the way they, they, they process data, and trust between uh, public authorities of different countries uh, uh, when they have to, to cooperate and in that context share data. So that type of convergence uh, can, uh, uh, as I said, can contribute to facilitating the exchange of data between public authorities, including in the context, for instance, of, of, of law enforcement cooperation. As the EU, we are certainly committed to, to promote and, and further build on that convergence uh, with countries or regional organizations uh, that uh, share uh, similar values. Uh, this can uh, include the, uh, so, uh, the, the adoption sorry, of a so-called uh, adequacy decision, adequacy finding by the European Commission, ensuring the, the free uh, inhibited flow of data between the EU and uh, uh, a, a third country, which essentially assimilates that third country to a member state of the EU when it comes to data flows. Um, this decision can therefore bring very significant uh, mutual benefits uh, to both the EU and, and the third country. Very recently, uh, the EU and Japan, for instance, announced the conclusion of a reciprocal uh, adequacy arrangement, uh, thereby uh, creating uh, the world's late largest area of free and, and safe uh, data flows. Um, we are certainly interested in exploring that possibility uh, with other international partners, including uh, in this region. So I will stop here. I guess I have already uh, uh, spoken uh, uh, too much, too long, and uh, I am uh, looking forward to also the discussion uh, and the exchanges uh, with, with the audience. Thank you so much, Bruno. I think you needed to have some time to explain the background as well, so that's fine. Um, the, the, the need for convergence is essential, of course, and uh, especially between trading partners. So definitely the EU has a lot of links with Africa, especially Francophone Africa. Uh, and in that region, there's a lot of legislation that are not in place. Uh, now, if we look at the adequacy list, it's also very small for now. Only 12 countries are complying uh, with the the EU uh, uh, regulation, sorry. Um, so concerns remain around compliance to, to, uh, to this regulation. And uh, there's also, you know, uh, several other legislation, especially in Africa, uh, with uh, the uh, convention, Malabo Convention on Data Protection and Cybersecurity. So there's a great effort indeed needed uh, first to build the capacity of countries to be in compliance with this uh, regulation uh, and also uh, to see how the different uh, texts that exist, huh? I'm just talking about the African Union, but of course there's the APEC framework, I mean there's many frameworks that are existing, so it's, it's a difficult uh, challenge for uh, policy makers to understand what is at stake and which way they should go for, in fact. So uh, I'm sure we're going to have an interesting discussion afterwards in, in, uh, in the room. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you said that the EU stands ready to accompany those countries to comply, basically, with uh, the regulation. Absolutely, and we are currently working with a number of countries. You're talking about convergence. Convergence is taking place as we're speaking. Yeah. And an example of that, and that will be a footnote, I'm not... Uh, the uh, Council of Europe Convention 108, which is mm -hmm. of European origin, but it's a universal convention, open to any country in the world. Uh, an, increasingly, an increasing number of African countries are either acceding or in the process of, of acceding, from uh, Tunisia to Mauritius, from Senegal to Capo Verde. I think that's another illustration of that uh, global trend I was uh, referring to. And uh, again, this is not about uh, looking for photocopies. This is about building on some commonalities and, uh, and on, on that convergence, um, which, again, for all the reasons I've, indica I've indicated, is, is uh, increasingly shared, including in Africa. 
Thanks a lot for getting back to the convention. Of course, I should have mentioned that first. I know many countries indeed, and I think the re recently Burkina Faso uh, access to it. So it is indeed uh, one of the tools that UNCTAD uh, has looked as uh, one of the most promising um, texts that exist uh, globally. I mean, regionally, but increasingly adopting you know, uh, memberships from uh, uh, other countries. So thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to uh, Ian Walden. He's Professor of Information and Communication Law and Director of the Centre of Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Ian has been involved in law reform projects for the World Bank, the European Commission, the Council of Europe, the Commonwealth, as well as UNCTAD. I've been having the pleasure to work with him for the past 15 years. Um, and uh, he has supported also numerous states in uh, drafting legislation on cybercrime, data protection, and so on. And uh, he was also in the expert group of the EU to support the application of the GDPR. He also leads the Queen Mary's Q Legal Initiative, which provides free legal advice and resources to tech startups and entrepreneurs. And finally, he's a principal investigator of the cloud legal projects. And Regarding this, we're going to talk about cloud. So, Ian, if we look at Africa, the adoption of cloud has been slow, and this is partly due to the lack of the legal and regulatory framework that we all already mentioned. Could you tell us how can cloud computing be facilitated in Africa? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. So, what I'd like to talk about is some of those challenges, because in some ways, uh, cloud take-up has been relatively uh, slow within Africa, but at the same time, most of you, I'm sure, probably have Gmail accounts or Facebook accounts or Yahoo accounts or a number of different uh, cloud-based services, and therefore it's never quite so simple a story as saying that cloud is not being adopted. It's about recognizing uh, the different challenges that arise. And in terms of uh, cloud computing, I think we need to be aware of the different dimensions of cloud adoption. It's not simply about uh, the deployment of different types of, uh, of cloud computing, whether it be public cloud, such as Facebook, or private cloud, which has replaced some of the traditional outsourcing arrangements. We have hybrid cloud deployments and, and community cloud. Those types of deployment are key. And we have to recognize that those deployments may take many different technological manifestations. They may take place through the use of hyperscale uh, data centers, such as those offered by uh, Google or Microsoft or Alibaba. Or those cloud deploy deployments may be very, very hyper-local. Uh, the hub of all things, which I refer to in the slide, is about actually creating a cloud environment within a community or within your own home and addresses some of those concerns that cloud computing raises about your data being remote uh, from, from, from your premises. So we have different types of cloud deployment. deployment. We have different uh, types of scale of deployment. And of course, part of the regulatory challenge that many nations are facing is to try and discern what sort of treatment should be given to the data centers that underpin uh, cloud computing. Because historically, for example, telecommunications, and in particular networks, have been seen as part of the critical national infrastructure or the public utilities upon which economic and social lives are built. And as networks have become endemic, we now look to data centers as being the places where we place our personal lives, we place our economic activity, we place our communities. And therefore, similar questions have been raised during this week, during the, the various sessions that I've attended. I've heard individuals talking about data centers as being public utilities themselves. And perhaps we ought to be ensuring that those data centers in the same way that we ensure that telecommunications networks have universal access, perhaps data centers should be treated in a similar fashion. So we are concerned with cloud deployment in and of itself. 
But of course, cloud is about facilitating other technological developments. And I think it's important to bear in mind that cloud is the underlying technical paradigm that facilitates machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, blockchain and distributed ledger, technologies that have imbued this week's discussions. They are dependent on the processing power that can be provided through cloud computing, whether on a hyperscale or a hyperlocal level. It depends on that sort of technological framework. As Cecile mentioned when introducing me, what's important is, of course, not just to think about one or two pieces of legislation, it's about how can we have a legal and regulatory framework that facilitates the uptake and adoption of cloud computing. And this slide illustrates a number of those different elements. The first one is, of course, that of, of data protection. And I amended my presentation during the course of this week to address some of the issues that I felt came up when I heard discussions about data protection. Because we are talking about protecting the privacy of individuals. Sometimes people talk about data protection as being about ownership. And I think it can be very dangerous to talk about data protection as being one of ownership in a global economy where the free flow of data is paramount to enable the efficiencies and the capabilities made manifest by cloud computing technologies. Cybersecurity has been mentioned in cybercrime. And cybercrime is an important framework element to give reassurance to those that want to use cloud computing in, as an environment. And we see here uh, in Kenya recently the adoption of a new cybercrime and cybersecurity legislation. But whilst there is a great deal of harmonization and acceptance about some of the common elements of what constitutes an adequate cybercrime framework, we've already started to see a divergence of opinion. Even in Kenya, the new legislation is subject to challenge before the courts because some of those elements of that legislation stray into questions of freedom of speech, questions of political suppression, questions of uh, preventing political opposition. A third element is intellectual property. And again, discussions this morning about the problems of having domestic intellectual property regimes, and yet innovators and entrepreneurs still choose to register and license their technologies from European or US or Asian locations because of the certainty that comes from not just having the legislation, but about the infrastructure that sits around it. And that's the first challenge I really want to come on to, which has been mentioned by Bruno already, but I think is actually really key because it's not simply about having legislation on the books. As Bruno said, one of the elements that is key to the GDPR, but is relevant to other areas of legal and regulatory issues, including intellectual property, is having the appropriate institutional framework in place. And that really is a challenge, I think, for Africa. The GDPR, as has already been said, talks about facilitating data flows between countries that have conver converged. But convergence is not an easy thing to do. Again, as already has been said, countries like Ghana, countries like Kenya, Ghana has already adopted legislation, Kenya is considering legislation, Mauritius, South, South Africa, Morocco, Cote d'Ivoire, they have data protection on the books. But the real challenge for data protection is not legislation, it's about having an institutional framework that supports data protection legislation, in the same way that we need an institutional framework that supports intellectual property, that ensures cybersecurity, that facilitates access to information. And here we really do have a challenge in the African continent. 
We have a challenge uh, about creating truly independent regulators. Independent from government, independent from regulatees, and critically, having the human, financial, and technical resources to give substance to the rules sitting in the legislation. And that is a real challenge in the African con uh, continent. And therefore, new solutions need to be sought. And I don't have those new solutions, but I would like to suggest a couple of ideas. One of those ideas in the, is piggybacking and converging regulators into a single entity. And for example, I refer to telecommunications regulators. Telecommunications regulators exist in every African state because telecommunications sector has liberalized over many years. And perhaps we can look to those telecoms regulators and build upon their structures, their human capacity, their resources to extend the scope of their regulatory purview to include issues like data protection, to include issues such as consumer protection. Because from the research that we've done, what is obvious is telecoms regulators, although focused on the communication sector, have been made responsible for certain privacy aspects that arise from communications, such as unsolicited emails, have been responsible for consumer protection measures in respect of contracts for communication services. So we may have to look to creating converged super regulators within the continent to try and address this problem of capability, capacity, and resource. And again, as Bruno mentioned, networks of regulators will also be a key criteria for a solution. The third element that Bruno mentioned was, of course, that question of enforcement. It's not simply a question of having the law on the books. It's not simply a question of having a regulator. It's about having effective and enforceable rights. And that is, again, a challenge that cannot be underestimated across the world, but particularly is a question that we have to address within an African context. The ability to have access to justice remains a considerable challenge. And again, we need to think about ways in which we can legislate to facilitate the exercise of enforceable rights, whether it be in data protection or intellectual property or any right, both commercial and personal, that need to be exercised. And again, effective administrative and judicial redress goes not only beyond the individual or the legal person, it goes again to this question of regulators. In the United Kingdom, our data protection regulator is not only an enforcement authority, it is also a surrogate claimant for data subjects. Data subjects can complain and they will take action on your behalf. So we need to think not just about the institutions, not just about the law on the books, but the enforcement challenges. The last area I wanted to talk about in terms of challenges, again, this question of the public sector. The public sector is incredibly important and substantive in Africa. And of course, cloud computing, or cloud computing offers great efficiencies in terms of e-government, in terms of interfacing with citizens. But of course, inevitably, governments are concerned about the security surrounding the use of cloud computing, concerned about foreign government access. In the news yesterday, even the United States is concerned about if it moves some of its Department of Defense processing into the cloud, will it be accessible by Russia? We have concerns about critical national infrastructure. People are aware about the attack to Estonia's critical national infrastructure by hackers originating out of Russia. And of course we have concern about public services. If government becomes dependent on the cloud and that cloud is vulnerable because it sits outside the nation, then the public services that people depend on may not lo no longer be accessible. 
But at the same time, those challenges shouldn't prevent the exploitation and the take-up of the advantages of cloud as a technological platform. And part of that is about the need to, for governments to assess the nature of the, the information that they process. Too often, we come across governments saying, well, we can't put it into the cloud because it won't be secure without really going through a process of thinking about and classifying the nature of public sector information, identifying those rules that actually require public information to be open, such as Kenya's Access to Information Act, as well as those rules that control and constrain access to data. But at heart, if government take a very positive approach to the possibilities of cloud, classify and identify the nature of the data that is processed, then cloud offers a much more efficient and effective way of processing personal data. Lastly, I want to think about solutions. And in that respect, I want to talk about regulation, uh, reg tech, or the ability of technologies to facilitate and address some of the challenges I've mentioned. The GDPR, one of the fundamental changes that occurred with the GDPR is the introduction of the accountability principle. And we've already started to see service providers coming into the market offering small and medium-sized enterprises compliance as a service. Actually, cloud computing can enable you to depend on others for your compliance activities. We've seen the emergence of standards and codes of conduct and certification schemes which enable you to have confidence in the services which you become dependent on. Bruno again mentioned the concept of data protection by design and by default, and I think that concept is applicable across a much broader range of legal and regulatory issues than just data protection, and has this potential positive impact on the upstream products, services, and applications that we become dependent on. And lastly, transaction monitoring. Much is made about the excitements of blockchain and distributed ledgers, a much perhaps overhyped technology. But in a continent plagued by corruption, in a continent requiring secure, immutable evidence of transactions, there are technologies, transaction monitoring technologies that can really have a real value add for the region. So with that, thank you very much indeed. One can recognize you are a teacher, a very good teacher, <laughs> the way you express yourself. Okay, thanks Jan for having focusing on solutions That's, uh, and come back to uh, the GDPR. Um, I think it would be interesting at the end to have the views of the audience on this proposed regulatory conversions. Um, thanks also for coming back to the important point, which is not to have a law in a book, but how to enforce it. And uh, as we are in Kenya now, um, Ian and myself had a project for uh, eight years, I think, in the region, in the EAC region, and developing regional framework, including privacy. And so far, you know, that's, uh, those frameworks were adopted in 2011, the first one, and 2013. And so far, we still see issues in transposing those general principles at the domestic level. So again, it's a very long process. And for some countries who have still, which have still not adopted legislation, it is a matter of keeping abreast of the new changes and, and reflect that and try again to pass the bill through Parliament. So it, it, it is a very lengthy process, and uh, and we you know feel this vulnerability as uh, as uh, citizens. On another on another side, uh, indeed, you refer to the e-government services. We can see when we do the e-trade readiness assessment that e-government services, whether they are renewal of passport or taxation, it definitely is a driver for people to go more online to understand what it is that it can facilitate their life, receiving salaries uh, through uh, mobile money, for instance, in this region. All this that can 
shorten time and, and facilitate the life, life of everyone. So we really need to, to see means of how we can have legal frameworks in place and enforceable ones. Now we're going to turn to Rachid Darago. Uh, sit, uh, I'm going to turn to French later. Uh, we wanted to hear from uh, 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 the experience of uh, an African country. So Rashid is an economist specialized in international development and he currently heads uh, the monitoring and evaluation uh, at the Directorate of Planning, Statistics and Monitoring Evaluation at the Ministry of Trade and Promotion of the Private Sector and is responsible for monitoring and evaluating the agricultural, agricultural finance incentive mechanism. Uh, you can explain what it is, I'm not so familiar with that. Uh, and in particular, Rashid was a national consultant that w really was helpful in driving the e-trade readiness assessment in Togo that we released in October. Alors, Rashid, no? Rashid, I would like to ask you, from your experience, what are the key legal challenges that uh, developing countries, and especially Togo, encounter to be able to integrate themselves uh, in um, uh, e-commerce and uh, digital economy? And uh, what development partners can you uh, turn yourself to for help? Thank you, Cecile. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored and uh, very pleased to present to you the uh, legal case of Togo and uh, I would like to thank uh, Anted for inviting me to be part of this panel. If you remember in 2014 in the report on harmonization of legal framework with regard to the community uh, directives uh, uh, in the Western African region, Togo was among the last in the group of ECOWAS because uh, we did not have uh, any legal or text that uh, regulated the e-commerce area and therefore we had that uh, legal lacuna and from 2013-2014 thank you to the uh, train for train program of uh, ANCTAD the program in which Togo uh, participated actively we were able to take stock of what was existing and what needed to be done and I think that uh, that's where the impetus came from. And today I can tell you that Togo is among the best, uh, if not uh, the best. Uh, we are among the best. And my presentation, therefore, will focus on the efforts that uh, the Togolese government has undertaken to be able to regulate uh, the e-commerce and economy, uh, digital economy uh, sector. My presentation will focus on three areas, uh, our national vision and the key figures with regard to the digital economy. And I will also be able to focus on the regulatory framework as well as the legal framework. And then I will talk about uh, challenges and perspectives uh, responding to the question that Cecile has posed to me. Let me also dwell on three key documents. Uh, one is on the National Development Plan, and the second one is on uh, declaration of the policy on the digital sector, and also the other one on physical planning for the country that are what you'd call the planning and programming in terms of the way in which Togo in short and um, long term and middle term will adapt and to uh, readjust ourselves uh, with regard to the digital economy. The digital economy is at the heart of our national development plan that covers 2018 to 2022 and which was adopted by the uh, Council of Ministers in August 2018 to be able to fast track the development of uh, sectors and priority, act uh, priority activities to modernize the administration and we have focused on three aspects in this document. The, the idea is to have a hub of excellence uh, for the sub-region and to t develop poles for agricultural transformation, uh, manufacturing and extractive industries and also to consolidate uh, social development and also to reinforce uh, uh, mechanisms for financial inclusion.
When you take the National Development Plan, this basically means that we want to be a logistical hub through the development of the digital sector and that's why our declaration of policy for the digital sector which was adopted in October 2017 very recently uh, underscores uh, the key aspects that I would like to enumerate here you will note that uh, the digital uh, would like to become the lever of modernization and development of our society and therefore the digital economy should contribute uh, to make uh, Togo a logistical hub uh, an innovation center and digital uh, competence and to be able to do this we need to develop national and international infrastructure in terms of uh, digital infrastructure and also to enhance uh, the ethical division of the economy and uh, in the use of this uh, economy in the, the most because the a rural economy, for instance, is uh, and a digital economy sometimes lacks the ethical aspect, and therefore would like to create a synergy, uh, a connection between uh, digital economy and the rural uh, economy in our country. We also need to have the national sovereignty in terms of the digital economy, especially cyber security and protection of our citizens. Regarding the strategy for this uh, digital infrastructure, there are two elements that are very important that I would like to talk about. First and foremost, uh, we need to improve uh, the digital coverage for the country to be able to guarantee uh, high speed access and to be able to have uh, uh, adequate infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure, and to also guide. Uh, a number of measures on the regulatory aspects, institutional and organizational aspects. Here we shall need to endow the country with uh, a global coherent uh, framework for uh, the digital economy and that uh, across the territory and to have uh, systems of general information that are performing and updated by all the actors on a daily basis and also to modernize and to digitize the process of request to be able to deploy the networks. This is the strategy that I wanted to present to you. And the three documents are what you'd call uh, the reference documents to be able to develop the digital economy in Togo. Let me talk to you about the key figures from Togo with regard to 2017-2018. Uh, Togo has a population of 7.8 million people and you note know that we are not many and our development policy is founded on integration. We would like to make ECOWAS as an integrating uh, uh, people or population so that the country be able to be placed right in the heart of 300 and uh, uh, 50 million people uh, from the ECOWAS. Uh, we have a land surface of around 556,600 uh, kilometers square and we have a, cro a growth rate of 5.3 in terms of business between 2018 and 2019 Togo has uh, gone up in the classification and it is the only African country that has made enormous progress in terms of uh, the number of places that we have won and we are part of the most uh, reformed uh, 10 economies in terms of the, at the continental level we are placed uh, 22nd out of uh, 54 countries in the uh, in Africa we are the second out of uh, the eight countries in the ECOWAS region and I would like to tell you that we have uh, done uh, reforms and the country is currently progressing very well in terms of uh, classification in terms of e-commerce on the B2C, we are 111 out of 144 countries for the uh, indicator on the fight against uh, ethics. We are 156 out of 176 behind Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal in the ECOWAS region. Regarding the classification on uh, post development, we are the first, uh, the first in the ECOWAS region. 
and 156 out of 176 countries uh, globally for countries classified uh, globally. In terms of internet users, we evaluated these ones, the internet users at 1 million. Uh, we have an uh, one operator of mobile telephone and uh, of fixed telephones and uh, two operators for mobile uh, companies and also three suppliers of internet access. In terms of penetration for mobile telephony, we were 48 in, number 48 in 2012 to uh, the position that you can see in 2017 and uh, we have uh, had a good leap. In terms of pen internet per, uh, penetration, we were 3% in 2012 to 36% in 2017 and also is also a major uh, advance with regard to uh, mobile payment in 2017. The number of subscribers is estimated at 3 million and the cost of transaction is estimated at 600 million euros. Therefore, this is the focus with regard to the indi in economic indicators and also socio-economic indicators for development for Togo. Regarding the uh, regulatory and legal framework, as I said before 2013, we had a legal lacuna and the only test that we had before 2013 was the law on electronic communication and that law was modified in 2013 and the law insists on competition by allowing opening up of the market to new players or new actors whose interest is the users and the law facilitates the planning in the country and also access to the greatest number to electronic services and also insists on the interest of uh, public security. Regarding laws on electronic trans transactions, what you notice is that the last three years, Togo has uh, done a lot of reforms and these reforms have enabled us to be able to advance uh, uh, massively in terms of uh, regula regulation of um, uh, the legal framework in terms of uh, electronic uh, transactions. And this law insists on the easing of formalities and procedures. And when you talk about formalities and procedures, we talk about administrative processes, uh, online payment and taxes and others. And it also focuses on uh, certification, uh, electronic signatures, and also their uh, legal rec recognition. The law also insists on uh, personal data. Uh, this law deals with information that will be dis available to the client and also the persons exercising uh, an activity of uh, e-commerce. And I would like to share with you the information that even the latest assessment that we were subjected to in Lome on the preparation of Togo towards e-commerce, the conclusion was that uh, we have a law that has taken into account uh, on personal data and therefore we need to reflect on whether it is important that we also have a law that is directly related to personal data because from that law we took into account uh, a major uh, areas and I also remember that uh, Cecil contacted me three or four times by email to ask me uh, what uh, consultancy firm helped us to draft this law and I would say that we had an interministerial committee made up of uh, uh, experts from and all stakeholders of the value chain of e-commerce and we had a French consultancy firm that helped us to draft this law and whose experts found very very inspiring. Regarding the second law that I would like to present to you is the law on uh, uh, information society that we called Lozito that was adopted in 2017 
the last three years have been very uh, active for the country a lot of laws were voted this law takes into account or guarantees uh, a responsible freedom of communication participation expression and creation of resources the law also provides for uh, digital solidarity through the organization of a system of access to the largest number of uh, IT users and also this law focuses on information um, and that will be availed to the client on people that exercise uh, uh, activities uh, of uh, e-commerce. We have a law I think uh, even Cecil was not aware of this law when she gave uh, the 56 percent. I think uh, I can tell you that this law was voted only that last week uh, on 6 December 2018. It was uh, passed in Parliament and it is the law on cyber security and the fight against uh, cyber uh, crimes. Uh, many of you are not aware about this law, but this law takes into account the updating of uh, our criminal system at the national level and also insists on the modernization and uh, disincrimination of um, classical and traditional law and the law has also procedural instruments with regard to the uh, digital environment it also defines the mechanisms for protection of cyber security and also sets up a framework for the fight against cyber crime it also provides for the creation of a national agency for cyber security that we like to call ANC it also focuses on uh, set the computer emergency response team and also focuses in terms of an organization to be set up that would call the security operating center or COSOC. The last law or the last uh, aspect that I would like to share with you is the law on protection of personal data. As I said, this is a law that is currently uh, on the line and it will probably be adopted in January next year. But the conclusions done by the assessment uh, in terms of the preparation for e-trade in e-commerce in, e in Togo, we shall take into account information that was sent to colleagues who are currently drafting uh, this law to see its feasibility and the conclusions and recommendations that will have been done by ANCTAD. The law that's currently I'm currently talking about takes into account the definition of uh, personal data and also on uh, demands on uh, conformity and on the uh, National Authority for Protection and also to set up an agency for protection. And this law has taken into account uh, the key guidelines on personal data uh, as edited by the UN National Assembly in 1990 and also this law is also aligned on international requirements uh, such as the national regulation for the protection of personal data that was talked about by the predecessor and other international requirements that are required for this law. In terms of challenges and perspectives when you look at this graph or this chart it somehow summarizes the findings or results that we had from the stakeholders in the e-commerce uh, value chain uh, question has put through to them and that question was on the fact that uh, if there is a regulation will it strengthen uh, their trust in terms of e-commerce and as you can see from the chart here uh 70 to 60 to 70 percent are in agreement even if we regulate they will continue trusting e-commerce the other challenges as well as perspectives is that there are a number of challenges the there are a number of them that is the, the lack of knowledge on the existing uh, legal framework actors or players have told us that uh, the existing uh, legal framework they did not know about this framework therefore we are supposed to undertake awareness raising 
about these uh, new uh, legal frameworks so that they can be able to know their rights with regard to uh, cyber legislation for e-commerce. It is also important that we also focus on an aspect that experts from ACT had brought out with regard to the law on electronic transactions because we also found out that this law does not take into account uh, transboundary uh, commerce or trade. Therefore, it is important that we review these aspects because our law on electronic transactions is somehow uh, subjective with regard to that aspect whereas today we are living in glo the era of globalization and we are supposed to have to trade with the rest of the world therefore it is important that we take into account those aspects and therefore what we want to do today is to work so that the country adopts the con UN convention on the use of electronic communication within the national constraints and that's a priority for us and we are going to work towards that with regard to uh, uh, skills, uh, legal skills, you will find that uh, a lot of our legal experts in our universities do not have this uh, culture of e-commerce. Of course they are legal experts, they know the law, but the law related to e-commerce is still very new to our university uh, legal experts. Therefore, it is important that we also train them so that they are able to acquire skills that are related to uh, development of e-commerce. And then the last point is that we need to undertake a strategic study of the development of e-commerce because today the report on assessment of e-commerce is still subjective. It's not entirely objective. It does not uh, detail in a closer way the realities, the problems, and it does not identify the responsible organizations or partners. Therefore, we need to have a strategy that will be able to take stock and deepen. Uh, and therefore, this workshop will help us to be able to have operational actions that will help us to get solutions to the issue of e-commerce. In terms of perspectives, I also want to focus on two aspects. I have talked about the issue of capacity building. This is a priority for us in Togo. The government is currently undertaking efforts with regard to capacity building and I would like to share with you two aspects related to the way in which we think that we can build capacity what we are going to do so that uh, our legal experts and the children who are in primary school be able to have the chance one day to be like Bill Gates, to be Steve Jobs. The idea is that we therefore have a project of uh, training on IT and that began in March 2018 and in this training project we want we want to set up uh, training modules in IT that are adapted to the needs and priorities of the private and public sectors. And this project is under the Ministry in charge of IT and national education and also for higher education. Therefore, there are four modules that have been developed at that level. We have four modules that have been identified and identified and uh, to the jobs that we think are very important uh, for the future. We have the first who is the experts in cyber security. Therefore, we are going to develop skills so that we can be able to train in cyber security. We have a second module which is uh, uh, technical uh, skills in IT and the other one is multimedia and internet and the other one is uh, experts in and da and data center. These four modules are very important. We have developed uh, modules that will help us to move towards that direction. What should we therefore do? I think we need to re review the curriculum and that's why I said that the Ministry of National Education is involved in this process and the Ministry of Higher Education. And the last aspect that I want to talk about is the creation of a tech hub that we call Janta in the local language which means Lion. 
uh, we call it uh, Janta Tech Hub. This is a project piloted by the Ministry of the Digital Economy and this project will help us to be able to create a technological uh, campus hub in partnership and to be able to uh, help uh, entrepreneurs to develop uh, digital actions and to train uh, actors in terms of uh, digital jobs uh, and it is a space uh, that will be uh, 3000 square meters for this uh, technology hub uh, for uh, digital entrepreneurship and to uh, lastly I would like to give you uh, these links on the presentations that I've given the data and statistics that I have used you may find them on the five sites that I have put here we have uh, a school of digital system that we have put set up and uh, supported by the Ministry of uh, Digital Economy we have uh, administrative uh, uh, portal where you can get uh, at least uh, a number of organizations in the ministries and when you go to togo.tg uh, in this portal you can find all the ministries and all the government organizations involved we have an open data and on that site, website you will be able to move towards uh, uh, getting information we have other sites that will help you get all the necessary information and I would like to thank you for your attention and I am at your service if you have any questions and the clarification that you'd like to get from myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rashid. First and foremost, congratulations. Congratulations for moving forward so much with your legal framework. The advantage for countries who have not yet put forward their uh, legal framework can incorporate the latest developments in the field. So you have taken into account European regulation and you are more advanced, for example, than ECO was that needs to really add to its existing directives. So congratulations to you for that. I think you've raised a very important point. In many countries, when legislation is made, it doesn't take into account cross-border aspects. But your country wants to carry out commerce, not just at national, but also at regional and international level. So there clearly there is a concern. The fact of ratifying the UNCTADA convention is a good thing, because it will enable you to resolve a certain number of uh, cross-border issues and to uh, increase consumer trust, which is necessary. So thank you very much. Soon I have to use my moderator powers just to perhaps ensure that the uh, speakers speak a bit less. I understand that everyone here is very passionate about their subject though. I turn now to Camille. A policy analyst at the African Development Bank. He's based in uh, Ivory Coast and he's working on ICT and data regulation. His work focuses on how data regulation should be addressed to strengthen the business climate and promote a competitive African data market while addressing the need to protect the consumer. Alors, Camille, comment... Camille, how do you think you can increase innovation and investment as well as competitiveness in African countries and of African countries when you don't have this convergence in legal systems on data protection to facilitate cross-border data flows. Merci, Cécile. Thank you, Cécile. I would like to speak in French since we have uh, interpreters here. French is my mother tongue, after all. Indeed, thank you, Cécile. I am currently working on data regulation for the African Development Bank. We are a multilateral development bank and one of our goals, main goals in fact, is to finance projects. So the question was about how uh, the data market is regulated in Africa as well as what impact cross-border data exchanges had on the development of electronic commerce 
I think at present there's a consensus on the added value of the cross-border nature of data. As mentioned uh, in this first slide, Africa would benefit uh, greatly from being able to adopt comprehensive tools which are really uh, based on the internet. We are investors. We tend to take a close look at the economic effects of regulation, in particular in order to remove risks from investments. We think that data regulation is an essential point for this. I would like to reiterate what's been said on several panels over the past few days. In Africa, there are not uh, at present many issues of uh, project financing. Investors are here when the business model and business case is identified. Through my presentation here today, I'll try to really focus on business models in the uh, data market in Africa. So as you can see here on this slide, at the end of the day, Africa is going to become a hub for data exchanges in the coming uh, years. We shouldn't underestimate the exponential growth of data exchanges. And we believe it will take around 10 years for Africa to surpass Europe, uh, the USA and Canada in this field. So what is the business case for Africa? At present, there is massive investment in optic, fiber optics, whether that's through submarine cables or on land, uh, 4G and satellites as well in order to provide coverage for the continent. We also have an increase in demand and therefore we're seeing a concurrent increase in investment in data infrastructure and data storage infrastructure. So we have to respond now to the need for data storage. We believe that uh, we have to have investment to cut costs of connectivity and attract uh, regional champions within Africa. Dependent focus on uh, secure data, but we also need for data which has a low latency because most applications at present require uh, low latency, in particular for uh, cloud services. One of the main challenges at present is the issue of state sovereignty within the digital globalized economy without borders. Through the various uh, exchanges I've had with member states, the issue of sovereignty is raised time and again in our discussions. I'll try and ask questions rather than provide solutions really. So what kind of cooperation should we have in Africa in order to overcome this issue of national sovereignty and really think about other forms of sovereignty? It's important to know that the issue of trust at present is a key aspect. We heard this in the statements of uh, previous speakers. To give you an idea, at present, we are focusing on data center industries because there is a great demand from nation states uh, and member states to build these. There's a very dynamic private sector here investing greatly in storage, mainly in South Africa. But here you can also see there are great projects in Morocco, Ghana and Kenya, of course, as well. I like this uh, first table because it shows the price differences for storage in the US or London and data storage in Kenya or Nigeria. You can see that uh, the difference can be, can be great between the US, London, Kenya or Nigeria, twice or even four times the price. So we need to reduce these 
to provide accessible solutions, in particular for SMEs in Africa. It's the cross-border nature of data at present, which is the main driver for the digital economy in Africa, in particular through the adoption of cloud solutions. There's also a need, though, to have caching and to store data in cached manners, in particular social network data. This image really speaks to me because you can see Africa as a whole. Due to its uh, large area, you could actually place the USA, China, India and Europe in Africa all at once. And I'm sure there's a story to be told about the industrialization of Africa here. It's by conducting economies of scale that will enable this. To enable economies of scale, we need to find solutions to these uh, localization issues for data to really have uh, pooled regionalized infrastructures. You can see on this uh, graph here that in terms of data centers, and my colleague will speak about this later, that when we speak about data centers, we can uh, see that the greater the surface area, the greater the economies of scale, and the more we can bring down consumer costs and really bring down the costs of the services provided. So the issue of economies of scale in Africa is very important, I believe. Of course, we also need to ensure that there's a symmetrical regulation across African countries and across regions in order to move risks from investment. Why? Well, if tomorrow I invest in a certain country because there are obligations to localize data, there is an immediate business opportunity. I know that the data will be captured within borders, so in that event, I build a data center to respond to needs. But what happens if tomorrow this localization is no longer necessary? I would have invested in a data center, which is no longer useful because it is very expensive. I could have gone to store my data in a neighboring country, which has uh, greater connectivity or greater access to energy and which is much cheaper. So really to look at this map of Africa at present and really understand really understand that it's not nothing that the digital economy has been so developed in the four regions represented because it's possible to have economies of scale when China proposes localization, it's very easy because there's already an existing market there. The idea is to have harmonized uh, regulation across regional economic zones at least to have economies of scale and attract investment. I think this will have a direct effect on the competitiveness of the states. I'd just like to give you one example. So in particular, it's Southern African countries which are doing this. They have a regulatory framework for the protection of data, which is quite comprehensive. This enables you to have the same level of protection for your data, whether your data is generated within or outside Southern Africa. South Africa in particular really wants to attract storage from outside its borders ensuring that data will be protected within it. I think this is an argument to attract uh, investors and uh, businesses because it is very competitive. On this image you can see the differences in regulation in Africa and disparity there. 
the graph enables you to take into account the disparate levels of regulation. I think I, the priority today, and this has been said before, is to have consultation with the public and private sector, multilateral consultation, and then to implement guidelines on concrete mechanisms for uh, data transfer, all while respecting the private lives of citizens. We need also guidelines which will enable us to implement these. So a regulatory framework. I'll speed up. I think the issue today in Africa is not necessarily to do with the absence of regulation. At the end of the day, there is a harmonized regulatory framework in ECOWAS. You have the African Union Convention. There is a model within the region, the SADC region also, and also in Eastern Africa. Rather, the issue is that you have to systematically take a regional approach for regional integration. Really, in order to confront economic models with hyperscale or localization in countries, to really enable economies of scale and regionalize infrastructures, this will remove risk from investments, reduce costs, and also this will promote the protection of consumers through regional infrastructures and harmonization. I'll skip this. These are the existing models in place. The uh, APEC model in Asia and Pacific is interesting. You can see this in the middle here. It's interesting because it takes into account the different levels of development of the member states in the field. At certain points, we have to think about the implementation of an African framework or sub-regional frameworks, taking into account these disparities and enabling them to ensure cross-border commerce while protecting the private lives of citizens. To conclude, we have to promote regional initiatives. Maybe we could look at uh, successful models or interesting models. So there's an issue in terms of uh, mechanisms for data transfer within a region. Finally, protection of data requires ensuring a minimum protection for all. I think at present we have to take into account the status of progress within African countries in terms of regulation and uh, adapt to this. Regional economic communities have to be the, at the top of the list in terms of this harmonization. And if it's proven to be effective, then you can harmonize this across the continent as a whole. I'll skip forward. I think the data regulation then is absolutely essential and should be on the agenda of all our member states. in particular because it enables us to improve the business climate, to improve regional integration of markets, because it supports intra-African investments, not just foreign investment. We have to remember that we have champions in Africa, we have uh, telecoms champions, we have uh, Manubi, for example. We have to ensure that these companies, these African companies, can really be able to develop throughout the regions. We also need to provide solutions to SMEs who also are a source of innovation. So finally, the nature of the digital economy is borderless and that relates to competitiveness. The African Union has a regulatory framework which is comprehensive, which enables it to be competitive and have weight in international negotiations. So why not have a harmonized system in Africa which enables Africa to really have greater weight within international discussions as well on this? Thank you. Merci Camille. Thank you Camille. 
you've also provided solutions. Indeed, the idea of the digital single market is important, and really beyond taking into account the different African regions, we have to really look at the continent as a whole. Last July, in fact, the African Union set out the foundations for this regional strategy on the development of the digital economy. He said the internet could contribute up to 10% of the GDP of African economies by 2025, and that's massive. This week, I've met a number of uh, donors from various countries who are ready to support these countries. But they have to be motivated within governments, within the private sector, and we need an alliance between the two. But just know that you're not alone, and there is a great amount of assistance available. Not just financial assistance, but really connections with all the partners that you'll need in order to achieve this figure. So thank you very much, and we'll move now to I'm not sure if Christian Mingou from the African Union is here. Yes, you're here. Christian, would you like to say a few words? Perhaps from where you're seated. We thought he was going to sit on the panel. We have two other panelists, in fact. Klaus from the European Union as well, in the room. Maybe just in a few words. Uh, Christian, since we're speaking about the African Union, you could uh, really set out the... set out the issues related to the Convention in Malabo, signed by 11 states and ratified by three, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritius, amongst others. So what are the main obstacles faced by member states in the implementation of a regional legal framework and continental legal framework? If you could answer that question now. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was on another panel. I was supposed to be here from the start. I think your question is quite difficult. Because I do think we need to talk to the 52 countries who haven't yet ratified the convention. And the 44 who haven't yet signed it, as you've said. At present, there's only three countries that have ratified it. I think the reasons for the non-ratification can be many. We are in a sector that is developing and changing very quickly. The convention was drafted between 2007 and 2009 and adopted in 2014 after a long process. Since 2014, a lot of water has flown under the bridge in terms of technological developments. Some countries therefore want to see if the convention as it stands at present really takes into account all of these new technologies in terms of blockchain, in terms of big data. They don't want to ratify a document or an instrument which is not uh, fully up to date and which doesn't fully take into account their concerns. I think that could be one of the reasons. Another reason could be the very nature of cyber security and the culture of cybersecurity needs to be improved on the continent. And that's also one of the goals of the convention. Cybersecurity issues can be a daily concern for every state and individual citizen. Everyone needs to take uh, or integrate this aspect into their daily behavior. Another source of concern for states could be that this is quite a long process within states themselves. And a lot is expected from them in terms of ratification. In any case, in the Commission, we are trying to speed up this process. We are carrying out awareness raising 
and we are lobbying countries at each session of the Conference of the Heads of States. At every one we lobby countries that have not yet ratified the uh, African Union Convention. We're not lacking opportunities to promote the Convention, not just with uh, regional economic communities, which we believe to be perhaps closer to the states themselves, to the states as well. At present, we're discussing with uh, ECOWAS to see how they could speed up the process. They have 15 states within them, even though two states within ECOWAS have already ratified. Perhaps we would encourage them to create global action to speed up the process for ratification. We have developed and drafted a, a manual which we have provided to the member states. This shows them the path to follow and strives to speed up the ratification process. Other guides have also been drafted along the same lines. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but in summary, that's what I'd say. Those are the possible reasons for the current status of ratification of the Malabo Convention. Thank you very much, Christian. Yes, I think at international level we'll have to think about how to facilitate amendments to instruments that have already been adopted. From 2007 to 2014, I think you said, we needed seven years to have a consensus on a text which is still not entered into force because we need 15 ratifications for this to happen. So at international level, this applies to many other conventions. It's often very long processes to update these. So we have to ask ourselves this question, because technology moves so fast, how can we amend these texts in a simpler manner? Thank you. With that, we'll move now to the private sector and see if they will go faster, because I think we'll go beyond six hours if we continue at the current pace. Founder and CEO of Madobi Corporation, an African mobile data service operator that provides innovative and inclusive value-added services to small-scale to large companies to uplift their respective economic and social development. He is involved in rural and local development of vulnerable populations in Africa through the use of mobile technologies, uh, situation sent specific content and community-led service provision. Dr. Anne Rose is experienced in both information and communication technology and in research, agricultural and agro-industrial development of developing countries. So, today, from the private sector, we'd just like to know the main challenges faced in terms of developing a platform. You offer a lot of services. So from the standpoint of the consumers and what you represent, and in terms of these services that you provide on your platform, perhaps you'd just like to share your experiences for the legal challenges that you face. Thank you. Bonjour, mais je sais pas si je vais répondre. Thank you. I'm not sure I'll directly answer your question first. If you'll allow me. Perhaps I'll be a bit impertinent, but uh, I would like to say something a bit different. I listened very carefully to what was said earlier, in particular about the difficulty in uh, setting up a functional regulatory framework, both in terms of uh, setting out these texts, implementing these bodies, and their capacity to regulate at the end of the day. I'm from the private sector, and I feel that we're perhaps defining something that's absolutely necessary, of course. It's very necessary due to the pace of technological developments in many countries. But we're trying to define a regulatory framework, and we're trying to set out the role of the referee without yet uh, having the players in place. The issue in Africa is that we don't have an economy which is currently sufficiently within the digital side, which is developed enough in order to, in order to regulate them. Camille earlier was saying that we need champions. 
we tend to think that these champions need to be African champions in Africa. No, we need leaders uh, from the African world. Europe has really need to regulate when it was faced with uh, global champions that came into the market. Uber, for example, Facebook, and the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal. They needed businesses to take on a global nature in order to finally have the foundational elements to take decisions or regulation. At present in Africa, our states do not have this. And it goes beyond this, in fact. You're right, Camille. We really have to support this. But in reality, what are we going to do? There's no real industry in Africa, no real African industry in terms of the cloud. For everything that we do, we're going to buy these cloud services from outside. Whether it's a server or even a smartphone at present. This is going to contain electronics and contain elements that we don't really master in terms of content. So to define the rules of the game in a global concept is very hard. We, so we don't have alternatives. And I think we need to really quickly see the emergence of African operators in Africa who are able to go and look at the global market to appear on the radar screen. At the moment, they don't exist, really. We have to support these economies in order to have the necessary foundations in order to exercise this regulatory power. If we don't do that, then I think that once again, well, I don't know what the future will hold, Maybe we'll make an unexpected leap forwards, but in any case, we will perhaps lose the prospects we have today. This isn't just uh, about the digital economy as we define it for e-commerce, but it's really job creation in Africa as a whole. Recently, I was in Bamako. Each year, you have 70,000 young people coming out of schools and universities without any jobs for them every year. In Senegal, I think uh, there's around 50,000 of these every year. Young Malians need seven years before they have their first uh, regular job. So there's a real fragility there. I'm just talking about economic fragility here because, uh, Rashid, earlier you touched upon uh, the agricultural and rural sectors. 70% of our population is still rural. You speak to them about regulation today. They don't have access to water, to electricity. So it's a real challenge. I think the conversation that we are having today is very important. If we are able to align what we want to obtain with uh, what we need to obtain it, it's difficult. We need big economies, we need more investment, as you've mentioned. To invest in the mobile sector, it's not very complicated. and Telecoms and mobile sectors increasingly don't own their own infrastructures. Often, they belong to manufacturers. So we have to make an effort to set up this regulation in the context which will also help us to bring on the economies of our countries. At a certain point in time, we'll have interesting debates on this. And the African Union representative, I'm sure we'll have uh, very significant reactions and greater reactions than those that we had today. Cabo Verde has one of the greatest data centers that uh, I've seen perhaps in the world. It's, it's magnificent, it's beautiful. But who knows about it in Africa? What's happening within our continent? Nobody knows about this. So we have this economic weakness which is endemic and we need to address this. We do have luck though. We have a lot of innovators on this continent. And that's also an added complexity then. Us and them, we collect data and at the end of the day laws are in place but they don't perhaps prevent us from doing business. For a long time we had our own data center, at present we have decided to put this on the cloud. So we are facing Amazon, Microsoft towards the outside. So if we don't enable 
this economy to really significantly emerge here, then it will be very difficult to, uh, to put all this in place. The protection of intellectual data and other things are very important. We are paying lots of attention to this. Our principle is that data belongs to the people from whom they were connect collected. I think that's a minimum. We were forced, in fact, to do this because we worked a lot with uh, UNICEF on protection of children because we had very sensitive data. But there's a political environment which can uh, favour this kind of decision in a country. We saw this over the de last decade. We've seen major changes which can affect your ability to protect uh, data. You can put malicious codes in smartphones, in servers, uh, blockchain and uh, regulated uh, platforms. But these regulatory platforms are not in Africa for most of them. Satellite imaging, where does this come from? It comes from Europe. So asking people to regulate something which they have uh, very little control over is a very complicated exercise. We'll only be able to achieve it if we effectively see economies emerging, see young c companies emerging in this continent. So we need data so we can really enter into a dialogue on regulation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for not having responded to the question. It was much more interesting. Well, um, and therefore, it, the private sector has its own regulation. It does not wait for laws to be made. But on the other hand, we have the good and the bad. We need regulation. Well, even today, if you wish, I think it's important. But I also think that uh, we need to replace the issue at the center. Well, we have well understood. I thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, legal issues is only one of the issues that we have to deal with. There are other issues as well. The digital economy does still not have the digital culture in the universities and that can be seen when we are doing our rapid assessments and that's something that's missing. Two billion Africans in 2050 and uh, uh, I think uh, we need to ask ourselves on what we shall do to be able to prepare a digital economy that's uh, flourishing and as you have said the champ uh, world champions that are African. Now we have Mr. Sampa. Shilufias. ...of the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission of Zambia. He has 16 years of experience in competition and consumer law enforcement. He was appointed CEO of the Commission in 2011 and is a former board member of Comesa Competition Commission. Currently, Shilufia is the president of the International Consumer Protection and Enforcement Network, it's PEN, and he was a steering committee member of the African Competition Forum. He sits on a number of boards uh, of professional associations and companies. And I would like to ask you, Mr. Sampa, what challenges do African countries face in cross-border e-commerce, and what are the possible responses to them? Uh, what kind of issues uh, do you African consumers on online platform face and how successful have you been in resolving them in, in Zambia? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the irony of being at the end is that most of the things are discussed. So, uh, <laughs> so it becomes a bit difficult. You are almost repeating what uh, everyone has said. But I think um, I, I would like to maybe start from um, a historical point of view uh, when we look at an economy like Zambia where previously it was a command economy and you, you really did not have consumer protection uh, as such because most of the uh, companies that were owned were owned by government and not necessarily seeing a need for a consumer protection law. So once you liberalize, then you have now a change in perspective because now you need to have a consumer protection law that will protect uh, consumers. And um, when you start talking about e-commerce and how e-commerce is going to affect the consumers, it becomes very difficult for a, a government to change that legislation. And so what you find is that you have a legislation which basically 
sits in um, uh, an environment which does not really take care of what has uh, developed over the years. So when you um, uh, think about what has now uh, occurred is that we still have laws. Uh, Zambia is one of the countries that is lagging in uh, uh, coming up with cyber security laws, coming up with uh, data protection laws. Uh, and, and, and to my knowledge, or at least from my own understanding, I see this as a resultant of the, leg the legacy and the lag that has been there. But what you have now is, is, a, is a law that looks at uh, a business to consumer only and does not look at consumer to consumer, does not look at uh, the other business to business uh, transactions. And because it is only looking at the business to consumer and I think one point that was raised uh, earlier on was uh, a regulator should not just be, uh, it shouldn't just be a, have a law, but you must have an effective uh, regulation. Now, the concerns that Zambian uh, consumers continue to face, even where you have a business to consumer and face-to-face -face interactions, are the issues of misrepresentation, are the issues of um, uh, goods not being delivered on time. So having an, an infrastructure where you still do not uh, necessarily uh, adequately address the issues. When you bring in new technology, when you bring in issues of cross-border e-commerce, that becomes something that uh, consumers will not trust at all because they cannot have, they don't have the faith in the legal system that currently exists uh, dealing with uh, transactions within country and where they can actually um, see the, the, the consumer. Uh, the, the, the trader. But our laws, again, if, if you think about what the e-commerce and even cross-border issues bring about, um, the, the fact that children can easily become consumers and, and can enter into agreement, when, when you really think about it, the, the laws that are there are telling you that to enter into a contract you need to be uh, of, of, of age. And, um, uh, how does a business on the other side of the, or the continent or to the other side of the world know that they're actually transacting with, with a child if that child is using the father's um, computer or mobile phone and so on. Um, then we have also issues that are dealing with, um, let's say, uh, poverty. Um, smartphones, uh, computers, internet connectivity, these are not things that are easily uh, uh, available to, to, to most consumers. So you, you actually see that that also becomes a problem in introducing the, the new technology to the, to the consumers. Of course, there's issues of lack of access. We've just seen a presentation on how, 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 how data saving costs are so expensive in Africa and, 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 and not uh, elsewhere, but Similarly, if you think about the introduction of internet and internet services and data bundles, they started very high and of course gradually they have reduced, but uh, there's still a lot more people because of poverty, because of uh, uh, a number of issues that they cannot have access to, to that at all. So um, how do we redress this? I think the first and foremost point um, is, is to have legislation in place. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, in Zambia right now, um, we are trying to use the telecommunication um, uh, uh, authority to also do the cyber crime um, um, uh, to, to actually uh, do that, which was a suggestion that was made by Ian earlier on. And I think that um, we can maybe uh, use the existing uh, institutions that are already in place to actually then implement or, or enforce the laws that uh, that are, uh, that may come in. But the, the 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 thing is, we need to ensure that we bring in trust in the consumers. It trusts not just that uh, they can engage in e-commerce, but they can uh, they know that they will have redress if they did engage in that e-commerce. They know that if something, uh, if their uh, information or private information uh, got uh, stolen, there is some kind of recourse that will be taken up. Um, let, let me end there uh, for the interest of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You you are the winner. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks a lot. No, I think that was really interesting. I mean, the baseline legislation is indeed uh, a must and, uh, and effective regulations as well. So now let me turn to Teresa Moreira. She heads uh, the Competition and Consumer Policies Branch of UNCTAD. She's my lovely colleague at UNCTAD. And um, she previously served as Consumer Director General of the Portuguese Competition Authority. She's, uh, she has also served as Portugal Director General and Deputy Director General for International Economic Relations, and she held senior positions at the former Directorate General for Competition. So now maybe you can tell us, in short as well, uh, what, the, uh, what are the essential steps that African countries need to uh, undertake to balance innovation, competition and consumer protection in an online environment? Yes? Well, good afternoon, everybody. And let me congratulate, well, Cecile, first of all, and obviously the fellow panelists, but also the audience, because this is a very interesting uh, set of topics, but it is, you know, uh, a long panel with a lot of interventions without you having had yet the opportunity of asking questions. I can also be very brief because I have addressed a little bit some of the issues in other sessions, uh, small sessions, but to answer to Cecile's question, yes, I also think that regulatory regimes are necessary not only to provide for consumers' rights, in the case of consumer protection, but also to create um, a predictable environment for businesses to develop, uh, and especially for uh, startups and entrepreneurs to flourish. I think that is very important. But I would also take this opportunity just to say that ANCTAD, our organization, is uh, the focal point for both competition and consumer protection uh, within the UN system, a responsibility that my branch has the, the, well, the pleasure to, to implement. And for that, we are the guardians of two sets of international instruments that I think are relevant here, especially for developing countries. Uh, one is the UN set of competition principles and rules that was adopted in 1980 and in a way recognizes the need for competition law and policy even, if I can put it like that, for developing countries and countries with economies in transition as a tool to assist them in pursuing economic, um, uh, economic growth and sustainable development. So this is very interesting because you have there are a couple of slides on, on competition. Of course, you know how beneficial that is. I think nowadays the challenge is what Professor Eleanor Forks from New York University shared with us this summer in our annual group of experts meeting, which is very simple, which is how to make markets work for the people. I think that is really the challenge because you hear about efficiency, you hear about fostering uh, innovation, but in the end, we as consumers, we would like to have wider choice, better service, uh, lower prices if possible. Um, the point of competition policy being a tool for development is actually quite well illustrated in the fact that since the 90s, we have reached from a small number of jurisdictions having competition, uh, adopted competition law, to almost 140 jurisdictions, which obviously encompass a number of developing countries, and interestingly enough, a number of regional economic organizations, namely from the African continent. So competition law and policy is really being in, understood as uh, a close tool to other policies, trade policy, but also why not, in some cases, industrial policy, IC or uh, technology policy, as I've heard already today. And my point is already to underline that I believe that these topics really need an integrated approach, which is something I think other speakers had already uh, mentioned uh, in a way. Well, consumer protection, even uh, maybe easier to grasp since we are all consumers, of course, with two angles. 
consumer protection in a way, and my, my colleague from, from Zambia very rightly uh, pointed out not only the consumer rights, so information, protection of economic interests, but also the right to dispute resolution and redress, for instance. Uh, uh, well, throughout this week we have uh, heard about access to justice, and it's true. Even, uh, even or even more, uh, moreover, for e-commerce and the digital economy. Uh, I, as a consumer who goes online to buy products and services, need to make sure that my dispute can be resolved if I get a product different from what I ordered, if my payment in the end is twice as much as I had foreseen, all of that. So dispute resolution and redress. And this is not just for the sake of consumers. This is for the sake of the development of new businesses and online trade. Because, of course, businesses will want consumers to feel as... Um, uh, um, it was mentioned earlier, consumers to have trust, to feel confident, to, to believe in the process, and for that we need to make sure that out of government's initiatives, but also business initiatives and international organizations' efforts, we all together put in place uh, mechanisms and combine measures and initiatives that provide for that consumer trust and confidence. Well, the sustainable development goals that we always uh, underline. Interestingly enough, even in UNCTAD, we talk more and more about consumer protection as a way of reducing inequalities. And I think that is a, a rather interesting angle for myself because it, was not, it would not be my first choice. But again, consumers need to get the benefits of liberalization, privatization, economic growth and development as citizens. So yes, reduce inequalities. And in a way, a competitive market also um, provides for these benefits to be translated to all consumers. Of course, I would like to mention the UN guidelines for consumer protection. They were lastly revised in 2015. And these uh, encompass nowadays three guidelines specifically on e-commerce. These are relevant because they state that the protection of consumers online cannot be less than the protection that we are granted offline. They talk about consumer privacy, which has already been mentioned here uh, in very uh, in, in much detail with a lot of expertise by the first speakers, I would like to say that also the, a new chapter on good business practices actually um, encourages businesses to consider consumer privacy and to put in place mechanisms to ensure data protection. And of course, national policies for consumer protection also cover both e-commerce uh, e uh, minimum information requirements as data protection and consumer uh, privacy. Here you see, again, a list of the uh, e-commerce guidelines that are relevant for this discussion and more or less almost the final word on the international cooperation. This has also been, I think, addressed by all the speakers. It is true that we are dealing with global companies in a well, in an international setting, so not only cross-border uh, trade, but the need that in the digital world we are able to actually get in touch with road traders and enforce law against road traders, and also make sure that consumers have their disputes resolved wherever they are uh, actually physically residing, really makes a very strong and urgent call for increased international cooperation. Um, Mr. Sampa did not mention that yet about ISPEN, but he's currently the president of ISPEN. ISPEN is an international network of consumer protection enforcement that actually tackles in a very clever and efficient way a number of issues that have come up in the digital economy, so I, I myself would like to mention that. And I would also take this opportunity to draw your attention to two um, recent documents well, produced by other international organizations, but I think are really relevant for this discussion. First, the OECD recommendation on consumer protection in e-commerce. 
It was first adopted in 1990 and revised in 2016. And even though it has really the best international practices that some developing countries may not yet feel that are necessary, it, it, it is a clear uh, relevant reference in this field. Also, something more recent that was produced, again, by OECD, ANCTAD also provided very, um, a very large set of inputs for this um, toolkit for, di for protecting digital consumers that was prepared under the uh, Argentinian presidency of the G20 this year. Also, a number of tips of checklists that I would advise you to follow. Finally, uh, a reference to our own studies from, uh, on, uh, that Cecile mentioned in the beginning. So the fact that we have actually gathered very interesting information on data protection legislation, e-commerce legislation, cybersecurity, and the importance of data as the internet currency and the fact that nowadays so many consumers don't even realize the value of their data and they are able just to give it for free, just for information, just to be in a mailing list or something like that. So again, awareness raising and education between brackets, not only of consumers, but of businesses through um, civil society organizations, through business organizations, I myself, I am a great believer in business engagement for effective consumer protection. So I would like, since we have met so many young entrepreneurs throughout the week, also to underline that self-regulation can complement consumer protection and can, pay, can play a very valid role, maybe even in the um, online setting. And again, uh, just repeating or summing up what I have said, Trust and a safe environment are as important for consumers as for uh, businesses. The, the needs and the utmost importance of international cooperation, as others uh, mentioned, it's very important to have a legal framework, but of course you need to enforce it. That is not always easy for, from a competition or consumer protection angle because you may like the tools, you may think you need to revise concepts. It's not necessarily the case, but you still need to better understand these market dynamics before you're able to intervene or even to forbid certain behaviors. And again, awareness raising, sensitization of consumers and businesses, of communities, and definitely a role for international organizations. ANCTAD stays, uh, stands ready to assist uh, developing countries and work and in head with other organizations in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa, for, for this. Uh, in Africa, we estimate this between 2% to 5% in the most advanced economies that do e-commerce online. Indeed, there's a lot of work uh, to uh, basically educate the consumers who are not used to go online, uh, as well as, as businesses, businesses. And whenever you have laws in place, Please try to make sensitization campaigns through radio or TV to inform or we have a good example in Uganda when uh, the laws on e-transaction was passed in order for businesses to be aware. Each time there was a, a meeting of a business association, then the slot will be given to the government to promote the legislation. So uh, thank you for also giving up a lot of resources that you can consult online and without it's five. 30. We have half an hour to go. I would like to invite our last speaker in the panel um, to uh, make a brief presentation if possible. I'm sorry if the other ones have taken more time than they deserved. I mean, the presentation deserved it. That's not what I meant. Uh, so, Isabella Hayward, she works for the World Bank uh, and she works in the digital development general practice where she supports the uh, delivery of, work of the bank operations and technical assistance related to telecoms and the digital economy across East Africa. Mrs. Hayward is also currently working on a flagship project to set 
a project set to enable greater application of cross-border platforms and regional e-commerce under the single market, digital market initiative for East Africa. So maybe you can tell us about you know, your findings um, and uh, what are the main legal and regulatory barriers uh, that hamper greater e-commerce uptake in Africa. I'll try, and I'll try to keep it brief as well. Thank you Sorry, very much. with me on the last speaker here. I'll try to. And um, je peux répondre à la question en français. Um, just to give you some idea of what this initiative is, so, so the bank works obviously across Africa and um, dig promoting the digital economy has really you know, become one of, of the main priorities. Uh, and some of you may have heard about this digital moonshot initiative by the, the bank is spearheading. But under that, we are also spearheading a few uh, integration initiatives on the provision that, you know, on several areas that, you know, Africa is still falling behind and that an economy of scale and network effects can really help leapfrog and help Africa catch up. And um, we, we've done some analysis then on, on East, East Africa which we see as kind of prime ground to, to start some of that harmonization effort, given that there's, still, there's already um, integration ongoing, and uh, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a tech hub center. So um, this initiative, uh, it's been a consultation with stakeholders that have come up with a shared vision and a strategic framework, and it's been based on a market assessment. And um, the strategic framework, which I think could add something to what uh, the rest of the panelists have, talking about, have been talking about. You've been talking a lot about a single data market. But if you think about the digital economy and, and an integrated economy, you need to think about more market layers than that. And it starts at, at what I think uh, the gentleman here said, that you know, it's, it comes down to basic uh, issues of connectivity access and expanding the consumer base and you know, ha having people accessing these platforms. And so it's also about a single connectivity market. Uh, and then the second layer would be a single data market, and the third layer, a single online market. And then also several enabling factors around that, such as digital skills, uh, you know, energy, transport, cross-border trade, all these things that plug into that as well, that can help create a single, a single market. So what I wanted to do, and I think Broadening it a bit because some all of the legal challenges that you've talked about have, have mainly focused on consumer protect, protection, competition policy, and uh, and data protection. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but maybe also pointing to some other legal issues. Um, so if we if we look at the single connectivity market, you know, how can we how can we speed up expansion uh, of connectivity? And there, you, you know, you have competition issues. You have the fact that li licensing is done on a national basis. Um, can we think of innovative ways where we can you know, interconnect broadband networks uh, to, to foster more competition in the, in the um, uh, wholesale market to then trickle down to the real retail market? Those are some of the things that we could be looking at. Um, we could also be looking at you know, how can we increase access to mobile uh, devices. <laughs> And that, that has to do with tax harmonization and, and, and VAT harmonization on you know, how much these things cost. Um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll speak less about the data, single data market because I think a lot of those issues have been discussed already. There we've been looking at things like data localization laws, uh, data monopoly, data content restrictions, intellectual property laws, which I think was also mentioned by someone else. Uh, the fact that digital copy copyright protection is quite weak. Uh, I think another two important factors that are critical to e-commerce, which we haven't talked about, is uh, digital identification and e-signatures. Um, as you know, the, the access to ID is still a huge problem across, across Africa, and not many countries have actually digitized their, e their ID systems. And there's not really reciprocal um, recognition of, of, of these across borders either. So that's, that's a legal challenge that we need to be looking at. The fact that many online platforms actually don't really provide for online payments and that there's not really harmonization of that legal, um, that legal uh, framework either. The fact that there's not interoperability between mobile platforms across Africa. These are also things that are hampering cross-border trade. Um, then if we look at um, 
e-transaction laws. I think that's also been something that we spoke a little bit about. Uh, there's more harmonization to be done in that area as well, for sure. And then if we broaden it even further, you know, what actually looking at how we're getting physical things across borders, so looking at um, trade and customs policies and harmonization in those areas, and getting the skills that we need to actually fuel e-commerce. I mean, there we have a problem as well with mutual recognition of diplomas and mm -hmm. uh, you know, benchmarking skills and allowing for labor mobility that could really allow um, uh, e-commerce to, to flourish in the region. So yeah, I th just thought I'd add those additional themes to broaden maybe the debate a bit because it's been very focused on data protection and consumer protection. So I hope that's useful and I will conclude there to keep it very short. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I think you won this time, this competition over Sampa. Well, that's very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I, I would just add that if you're interested in digital identities as a panel tomorrow, that I would be happy to moderate uh, at 11 in room three. So if you're interested in, in that and the African continental free trade, please join us tomorrow. Uh, now let me open the floor to uh, to comments uh, by other delegation. I know we have Klaus Pendel, who has been very kind to remain seated for three hours like you all in this room. And if you can make a tiny intervention, if you can, uh, because it was scheduled as well, but uh, among the, the coordination, you know, this, this uh, week has been very hectic in terms of coordination, so it's possible that I missed an email uh, about Klaus wanted to present something about online platforms. So Klaus, you have the floor for three minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, I was not uh, sitting here for three hours because as my colleague from the African Union Commission, we were in another session, so... But what, what I heard... What I, what I heard uh, with, with great interest was, was a very interesting uh, di discussion and maybe to pick up uh, from two things which were discussed a lot. One is uh, regulation, what kind of regulation and what I heard uh, as well, for example, from the colleague from the African Development Bank was econ economies of scale, uh, uh, creating a digital single market, something like that. So I think about regulation, there was slightly the question, uh, yes or no. I think we all agree that there is a need for regulation. So the second question is then, what kind of regulation? Uh, there is often a discussion, light touch, uh, heavy touch. I think it's not, it's not correct. It really, it's more complex. It depends on, uh, on, on the concrete need. So it's, you have to find, the, as, as regulators uh, or lawmakers, you have to find the right touch regulation. Um, so the Portuguese colleague mentioned uh, competition policy. In the, that is a clear case where it is quite good to have a strong hammer. If, if you have, for example, a very big, uh, powerful uh, company, which, which is abusing a dominant market position, it's very good if somebody has, has the right to, to go against that and to give a substantial fine, as for example the European Commission is in the, in, in, in the power to do so. In, uh, but having said that, uh, uh, the, the, the EU's approach is, uh, is, is usually to start from, uh, with a very soft approach. So usually we first make a study of the market, is there any problems? We, we consult with stakeholders. And so that if there's no problem, there's nothing to fix. So keep your hands off. Uh, and then uh, usually we try to, 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 to make a first step by pushing self-regulation of companies to see if this works or doing co-regulation to, to do it together. And only then, if we identify clearly a need to do something, we go into the lawmaking which is then uh, accompanied uh, by competition policy, of course, in, uh, in the later stage, and by international cooperation in, in a trade environment, uh, regulatory cooperation, etc. So, so that's basically an approach we do. Uh, and then uh, we have, a, in this field, uh, talking about e-commerce, etc., we have this, this flagship uh, strategy, the digital single market, 
which you've, before I came, I know the, you heard about uh, the GDPR, which is a very important uh, part of, of this initiative and which has got a lot of international attention. But there is a lot of other in, uh, initiatives going on. Uh, for example, relevant for, for e-commerce, uh, in April this year, the, the Euro European Commission proposed uh, uh, a regulation uh, on the relationship between the powerful platforms as in inter intermediaries and businesses. Because there's millions of small companies which depend on selling their content or ser services or uh, whatever, music, whatever, uh, through platforms. And while we think that platforms are very, uh, very, very useful and we are pro-platforms, uh, with the same approach, if there is an abuse of, of a business practice, uh, then uh, it is good to do something. And we had reached uh, the opinion that it was, was good to do something. So on, on this regulation, which is not adopted yet by the co-legislators in the EU, uh, we are focusing on transparency, so, so clear uh, rules, uh, terms, uh, term, uh, terms of contract between the platforms and the businesses, uh, which cannot be just changed without notifying companies, etc., etc. Uh, and transparency uh, when it comes to delisting of, what, of offers on, on these platforms. So we want that the, that the, uh, that the conditions for, for taking them off should be identified in the terms of contract already to have some clarity. On, and, and then following from this, from this uh, a possibility for, for redress, for mediation, uh, so that uh, not only the consumers, like in consumer protection, but also businesses who are dealing with platforms have a right to, to well, to have an in-company uh, settlement of problems or to, to go to an independent mediator or to go to court. And on top of that, uh, we, we think it's necessary to have, have uh, monitoring so we, uh, we have al already established an observatory which watches how the, the market is functioning and if it's functioning fine, it's good, but, but we will have the research if we need to, to, more, to, 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 go, to take stronger action to, to actually do it. And that's basically a similar approach we followed in many fields like uh, end of roaming, uh, uh, ab abolition of, of some parts of uh, geog ge geographically blocking uh, the use of online content, etc. Uh, we have done something on, f on facilitation of uh, rules for value-added tax when you do online uh, uh, shopping, so one-stop shop. We have looked into to making it uh, more transparent and cheaper to have uh, s parcels sent across uh, frontiers, which is a big physical barrier for e-commerce. So something also which I see similar here in Africa. Well, there is some work on, uh, on privacy, etc., etc. So, so it, is a, it, it is a coherent approach we, ha we, ha we have to do. Uh, and that, I think, uh, feeds into this comment uh, Camille was saying, that both in Africa and the European Union, uh, it is really beneficial to create a digital single market with uh, one open big market with scale, with one set of rules, which is beneficial for business, for, for consumers. And if you then go to this, pro I'm coming to the end, if you then go into this, to this problem of not having African champions, for example, which is a problem we have in Europe uh, to a certain extent as well, that is, that is uh, the best way to, to, to lay the groundwork to, to have a big market where, where, where the creativity can, can flourish. And then hopefully sooner or later we will have more of these uh, African or European uh, digital champions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Klaus. I think there was, uh, yes, we can applaud. Absolutely. I think there was a, a, a good uh, sum up. Uh, so that was very good. And also adding, you know, the experience of the EU. If you have, I know you have a presentation, we'll be happy to upload it. So hopefully there's some references that people can go to as well, just to have more information. Now I'm open the floor to, I'm opening the floor to the room. Please raise your hand if you want to say something. 
And uh, of course, I would encourage you to be brief because we have only 15 minutes to go. Um, and if you can also say who you are. Yes, Minata. <laughs> uh, merci. Thank you. I just wanted to speak on personal data. Minata, I know you are, but maybe the others don't. Perhaps you can introduce yourself. So, Minata from Cabinet Carabas, a, a legal advice uh, office in Senegal. I just wanted to speak on the issue of uh, personal data. Very recently, as we know, in the European Union, there is, or there's been regulation on non-personal data. In terms of implementation, this regulation is uh, complementary to the RGPD, but in terms of implementation, this is anonymized data, and as a result, uh, requires algorithms to make this personal data anonymous so that it can become uh, non-personal data. This raises the issue of the regulation of the algorithms themselves, since they're uh, an additional element as well. I'd like to have your opinion on that issue then. In addition, from an African standpoint, the 108 Convention was opened up to ratification by African countries, several of whom did so. On the free circulation of data, non-personal data, what cooperation framework is being set out for African states who are doubly concerned by this? First of all, for those states that have ratified the 108 Convention and who are also affected by the uh, RGPD, RGDP, because it's applicable in African countries. On the issue of the data of Africans affected by this free, free circulation data in particular. Thank you. Merci, Minata. Minata, I'll take uh, other questions now, if there are any. Martin, Alessandro. Thank you, Cecile, and all the panelists for all the very interesting and complementary presentations. Maybe just a point that I would like uh, to bring to the discussions uh, uh, is about the cost of compliance to regulations, because we have heard a lot about how important uh, all the regulations are, and uh, the cost of uh, non-complying and not having the appropriate regulation is too high to be ignored. But when you, when you think about uh, uh, the business environment, uh, especially in African LDCs, and uh, the difficulty that uh, startups have to transform into sustainable business. We can't, I think, ignore also uh, the way that uh, we should promote uh, in, uh, in order to have uh, these small businesses also uh, co having the capacity to compliance with the, with the regulations. And also, in just another comment, another comment building on uh, the importance of competition policy and regulations uh, between uh, regulations and market. Also, what is important is to spread a culture of uh, regulatory impact assessments, uh, because we have seen, for example, uh, in uh, Uganda when they introduced uh, taxation on, uh, on mobile money, the effects that uh, it had on the market, uh, and the signals that it sent to uh, operators also in the e-commerce business, business, then I think that is something that should be um, carefully thought about. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. He has introduced himself. Alessandro Vitale is a trade expert and has been conducting two assessment, e trade readiness assessment in Africa. Yes, I recognize Pakistan here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Cecile, for uh, uh, giving me the floor. I'm uh, Atif Reza. I, am, I have come from Geneva. We are the coordinators of the G77, which is uh, the largest group of developing countries, largest group in the United Nations. Very quickly, I will highlight two issues. Uh, um, uh, we heard uh, from uh, Professor Ian Walden about uh, one particular issue of data ownership. He said that it's dangerous to talk about ownership of data in a global economy where free flow of uh, data is so critical. I, I, I rather feel it very uh, interesting because uh, I think it's dangerous not to talk about uh, data ownership 
partnership because it's an important issue and we need to have a concrete result-oriented discussion on what does it mean. I, don't you think that GDPR itself is something that has talked about at length of how data should be managed because if we have indication that their data, user data needs to be protected in a particular way, um, we are certainly uh, talking about is a certain dimension of data ownership. Secondly, I would like to just highlight about um, issue that was discussed um, uh, by a number of panelists uh, about regulatory convergence. I mean, regulatory convergence uh, is, is a very good term uh, to start with, but um, at, at whose term um, we should be converging because um, right now we do have uh, mechanisms but those are um, in, in developed countries. In developing countries including in Africa and many Asian and Latin American countries those are either not non-existent or at a very uh, infancy stages. So I'm, I, I, I don't expect a very detailed answer on this, but just would like to highlight that it's very important for all developing countries to be at par discussing those issues, and particularly at uh, the UN level, because we haven't gone beyond uh, a certain level of generalized discussion and uh, resolution at the UN, and if we talk about uh, data privacy, then at the um, Human Rights Council. And uh, of course, we do have this uh, 2016 uh, Human Rights uh, Council Resolution 3164. But I think beyond that, we haven't really got hold of these issues um, in, in, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Atif. Um, I, I saw a hand raised here. Is there any question here? OK. If not, ah, <laughs> in the front. Merci, Cécile. Thank you, Cécile. My question is also for all the panelists. I'm Malik Delio, uh, first advisor for the permanent representation of uh, Senegal in Geneva. I just want to highlight a few points. Maybe start with what uh, Atip just said on the discussion on data. A few days ago, I listened to a big Chinese CEO say that uh, data is the oil of artificial intelligence and China is the new Saudi Arabia. This uh, reflects a bit the importance and value attributed to data. The policy of the European Union, for example, on uh, data also reflects an economic dimension. I think our friend from the African Development Bank set this out quite well. There is this whole economy of data, in particular with regards to processing and storage of data. This is carried out throughout the world. And I think that you estimated that for 2020, well, this would amount to 106 billion euros. So there is a real need to have policies in place in the field. African countries also need to be able to take part and be involved in this market worldwide. I think that the African Development Bank highlighted this there is a need at African level to really boost entrepreneurship and to support companies and to develop ecosystems and businesses so that they can reach this stage. I'd also like to touch upon the need for cooperation at international level. We need to implement policies to protect consumers and implement policies in terms of competition at the global level. On competition through networks, whether this is done through UNCTAD or the international competition networks, this is already quite good. 
but uh, sometimes there's difficulty in reaching agreements with other great uh, competition agencies globally in order to really intervene or collect information from these authorities. Sometimes we need cooperation agreements which are often not actually signed between these various entities. The issue becomes even more crucial when it comes to the protection of consumers online. In my opinion, it's important that we find uh, mechanisms, and I think Mr. Sampa, who chairs the network of uh, consumer protection authorities, can uh, perhaps enlighten us on this, to see how this cooperation can really be effective. At the same time, for major authorities and agencies, and for all those who lack effectiveness. How can we resolve this issue? I think it's a challenge. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Malik. Thank you very much, Malik. Now I'm afraid we have to turn back to the panelists, and I would kindly ask the interpreters if they can extend a little bit, because I think it's already five to five, uh, six to five. Five to six, yes. <laughs> We're all tired. Thank you, Torbjorn. Um, and uh, then I will, uh, I will just say, before I pass the floor to the other panelists, because if I don't say it, Torbjorn will say it in my place, uh, concerning the uh, remark by Atif, uh, we're going to have a discussion at the UN level at the next e-commerce week on the role of the va and value of data in e-commerce and the digital economy and its implication for inclusive development. So you get another platform to talk about that. Um, now, going back to the questions, uh, I think I would give the floor to uh, Bruno Giancarelli uh, concerning the data ownership and regulatory convergence, or, or Ian and, and okay, the start. duet. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> be brief, please. <laughs> I, I, I will try to be very brief. Those questions raise many issues. I will concentrate on two. Uh, on two aspects that are particularly relevant to what I explained before, uh, the issue of cost of compliance, and then maybe react to a very common, I would say, misunderstanding about the GDPR. When I hear the GDPR applies in Africa, uh, uh, that's uh, not true, actually, and I want to uh, 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 comment on that. Um, uh, cost, of course, cost of compliance, and that has been uh, very much uh, at the center of uh, the reform uh, we have adopted uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, because of when you when you harmonize, uh, when you uh, simplify the regulatory environment, you cut uh, compliance costs. And the problem we had in in, in, in Europe was having 28 data protection laws uh, 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 in a sector which, as, as we said, is, is, is borderless by, by nature. Um, so that's certainly something which uh, we believe is, is very important. And that also brings us to what we have said about uh, we can then apply that at the international level or at the regional level in terms of, of, of the benefits of convergence and why convergence uh, pays off also uh, as, a, as a, a, a source of uh, reduction uh, of uh, compliant cost. We have also, uh, with the GDPR, um, abolished all sorts of uh, notification uh, requirements uh, that uh, were basically inefficient but that in terms of red tape, especially for uh, a small and medium em enterprise, could, could uh, uh, be quite significant in terms, in, in terms of costs. So uh, that's why the approach based that we also discussed, based on accountability and ex post enforcement when it's needed, is for us uh, 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 more efficient uh, uh, and uh, also from, from a cost point of view uh, uh, um, uh, important. Um, and all this, by the way, the, the harmonization, because your first question was, what does the GDPR mean for foreign operators? 
the question of the reduction of compliant cost, the cost of the question of reduction of uh, uh, the uh, red tape is very important for foreign operators offering goods and services in Europe, and especially small and medium enterprises that, in general, are uh, uh, particularly uh, concerned and hit if there are if there are high barriers, if there are compliant costs. Uh, quickly on the second aspect, uh, because that's uh, something I, or I hear not only in Africa and many areas of the world. Well. Um, it's a bit of an urban legend uh, that uh, the GDPR uh, applies across the globe. No, uh, uh, the GDPR applies to the offer of goods and services in the EU to EU individuals, uh, including, of course, by, uh, uh, by uh, foreign operators established uh, uh, abroad, but only if they target specifically uh, EU mean individuals in the EU. For instance, uh, since we are talking about e-commerce, by uh, uh, offering goods and services that can be bought in euro, for instance. So that when there's a, a specific element of targeting. Uh, but if I'm here in Kenya as an EU individual uh, uh, um, buying something or registering at my hotel, of course the GDPR doesn't apply. Uh, if and when I will be back in Brussels, I uh, uh, access a, a website, an, Af an African website, a Kenyan website, uh, which again doesn't uh, specifically target me as a EU consumer, the GDPR will not, uh, won't apply. So I think and uh, our regulators, the European Data Protection uh, Board, which is the group that uh, brings together uh, uh, the uh, 28 regulators, have just issued a paper on, on this question of uh, the application and the geographic scope of application of, of the GDPR. Uh, uh, that's uh, very important. Of course, uh, 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 that uh, doesn't uh, Diminish the, the, the relevance of what I was trying to explain before is that we see a lot of convergence around the world on the basis of a, a number of common elements, and that's what we should work on. Uh, increase that convergence, build on that convergence, which doesn't require any photocopy of the GDPR, uh, um, uh, 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 but is, 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 it, it could be a source of a number of important benefit and advantage. And a very la short and last third point, and that brings me to costs. Actually, what we see as a source of costs in many, in some data protection legislation we are seeing, and I would be a bit more controversial here, or, uh, and that's certainly not an element of convergence, are localization requirements. Localization requirements are, yes, sources of costs in terms of having to set an infrastructure, in terms of having some time to uh, duplicate infrastructure, to at least keep a copy. And our, mod our model in the EU, our approach in the EU in terms of data protection has never been based on localization. We believe that we can have a system which strongly provides for strong, robust uh, protection of data, but at the same time is open to data flows through a number of different elements. Uh, and, uh, uh, and localization has nothing to do uh, 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 with uh, uh, privacy and, uh, and data protection. That's very important because, and we have as the EU uh, um, uh, submit observations uh, uh, in, in a number of countries uh, that are uh, including localization requirements in the data protection uh, bill or legislation, uh, uh, clearly uh, drawing a line uh, between uh, the uh, protection of, of privacy and um, measures uh, that are of uh, uh, more protectionist uh, uh, effect or, or nature and that have, again have nothing to do with privacy. Thank you, Bruno. <clears throat> I think this is opening another debate. Unfortunately, we don't have time. Ian, you wanted to react? Uh, just on the data ownership point, uh, I wasn't saying that data ownership wasn't an important issue. I was saying there is a, a common myth that data protection is somehow a data ownership measure. Where, and I think that it's a mistake to equate ownership, which is about exclusivity and the about ability to exclude people, and uh, the rights and the entitlements we give to data subjects under data protection law. So I, I think that I, I've heard that at least three or four times this, this week at this event of data ownership is, is equated to data protection and I think that's a mistake. I think that's a mistake because uh, data protection tries to meet a balance of rights, the rights of users as well as the rights of data subjects. 
And the only other point I would make is I have to completely disagree with Bruno. The GDPR is an extremely expensive and costly regime for companies to implement. Uh, and I would also have to say that uh, getting rid of notification, uh, certainly in the UK, it's just been replaced by another method of paying for regulation. You have to pay for regulation, whether it's central government or polluter pays. And personally, I think polluter pays is probably the best way of paying for data protection regulation because central government certainly aren't going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. There was also a question on... Uh, sorry. Yes, there, there's also a question for Aminata regarding the regulation of algorithm. Ian, can you address that or you can address that? Oh, I can. Uh, sorry, in terms of regulation of algorithm, I, I, I think this is a, a very critical issue. Um, the GDP, GDPR does have a, a regulation of algorithm, algorithmic transparency designed to protect individual rights, and I think that's a, a real innovation that needs to be um, replicated in other fields. I, I think algorithmic transparency is an important part of competition policy, for example. I think it's an important part of, of litigation and evidence. But we also have to balance, again, similar to my previous point, between the, the intellectual property and the investment and the innovation that is present with algori algorithms and the need to uh, have certain transparency about that algorithm in certain circumstances. So again, it's a balancing act, but I think the GDPR, one of the great innovations, well, it's not an innovation from the GDPR, it dates from 1995. It's a recognition that there that, that should be a right of appeal against an automated decision. Thank you. Thank you for being brief, and uh, I think indeed this poem was important. Now we leave the floor to those who haven't spoken yet uh, in this uh, last session, so to give you a chance to uh, respond or address something that was not uh, that has not been addressed. Shifulaya. Thanks. Um, there was a question on how we can use the ice pen uh, for uh, enforcement. Uh, ice pen is basically. Um, a, a, a network of uh, uh, consumer protection uh, uh, enforcement um, uh, authorities. There are about 64 countries that are currently with the ISPEN, and it is demand driven. So basically, the countries that are within the ISPEN set the agenda of what. Uh, what to look at in terms of consumer protection. And um, what uh, the Zambian presidency has been trying to do is to encourage a number of African countries to join the ISPEN because currently there are only seven countries um, that are uh, seven African countries that are members of the ISPEN, with the majority being the European, and then you have the Americans and the Asian countries there. So the agendas have not necessarily been those that you'd think the African continent would be more interested in. Uh, but just to mention a few, um, there are a number of working groups. One is on the digital terminologies. There's egovernance.com, basically meaning uh, different agencies will put the type of problems or type of complaints that they receive over time and then you, you share this this information. There is digital technology which addresses cho children, um, the financial services which is something that we brought out as a, as a Zambian presidency and also educational services. So just to give you a, a, an idea of uh, what type of um, uh, issues are discussed at the ISPEN, but I, let me emphasize that it's demand driven, so if you're not part of the group, it's difficult for you to influence the agenda. Thank you, Shi Lufia. Uh, now I pass the floor to Teresa. Thank you very much. No, just some final words on something that I don't think was necessarily very much underlined, because of course the data, I think data issue is so important, which is the role slash responsibility of um, digital platforms, because we have, I have heard a lot of questions around this topic here. And again, I would agree with several, um, uh, well, speakers and, and and um, questions from the floor on the need to not over-regulate, even from a competition or consumer protection side. But it is also important, especially when you're considering new businesses that are um, well, offering goods and services and may be a little bit uninformed about their obligations. It is important, especially that governments, but also 
civil society organizations, obviously academia, business organizations, look into digital platforms, special between brackets, roles and responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis consumers, and also the role they play from a competition uh, point of view. Thanks. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Camille, you want to add something? No, I guess uh, I like the intervention of Daniel. Um, I do believe in, in self-regulation. I do believe that uh, regulation is important to, to put in place a, a framework, but definitely uh, uh, the businesses benefit from the trust of the consumers, so they should be also the ones that are uh, uh, providing uh, the trust uh, in the digital economy. So I don't know, Daniel, if you have something, uh, you know, to, to say about that. Um, and just to to conclude, um, obviously we we can't regulate the same way in Africa that in in the European Union, for instance. Uh, that's why I was uh, focusing my intervention on. Um, implementing mechanisms over the top. Let's consider that uh, the African countries are not all equal in terms of regulation, but let's try to at least implement mechanisms that allow cross-border flows with trust mark accountability, and accountability is exactly the, the role of the private sector. Thank you, Camille. Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with you. It's, it's a very serious issue. We have to address it. Regulation is very, very important. But again, uh, we have to be sure that we have all the elements in our hands to do it. And one of the missing elements is the one I mentioned about the fact that we don't have enough uh, elements uh, active or visible into the radar screen regarding the African economy itself. I would speak more about honorability. I used this word yesterday or two days ago. I'm coming on, on it again. It means that we know each other in the same chain. We are sharing the same values. And we are ready to put on the table the business model and to share the revenue of this business model together. That's required data. We cannot do it without data both parts, and we need to have granular, some granularity into this data, and today in Africa we don't have it. And I have very clear examples of, 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 of what we are talking about. It's not only between, only between African countries, but also it's between Africa itself and the rest on the other continents. Today, for instance, in Europe, you have a, a strong uh, satellite uh, industry, they are observing African continent with a resolution of five meters, with the Sentinel, for instance. They can even know who is, grow who is growing what, where. So how can we deal with this information? How can we regulate the use of this information for the benefit of Africa as well, not for the benefit of the industry in Europe? So that's a strong question, I do think, which needs to be discussed and debated. But I'm happy to say that, I mean, what, you, what we discuss in this session gives us a tremendous feel of, uh, of, of, of exploration to respond to this question, but we have to work together, and this is probably your role also, Camille, at the African Development Bank, to help to make some uh, African champion emerge and be able to be around the table to talk with uh, these topics. With, uh, no, definitely. Uh, and I, uh, just to conclude, I agree that uh, there is no way to regulate if we don't build the business case first. That's it. Thanks a lot. I think we have now to give a big applause to the interpreters, to you guys in the room sitting for so long, and to the panelists. Thank you very much, and I hope we can continue this discussion at the next e-commerce week in Geneva from 3 to 5 April 2019.